So Seamus, it's that time of year again where people have to rewrite their checks or something? Wait, wait, how do birthdays work again? I don't know. But yeah, it is that time of year, um, especially for me. This goes up on Monday. Um, so if you're listening to the show on Monday, tomorrow I turn 50. And I would just like to say that the internet has ruined birthdays for me. <laughs> okay, I'm bad at remembering birthdays. I remember a couple. But, you know, some people are good with birthdays and they always remember birthdays. And in the pre-internet world, I used to find it so gratifying when somebody would remember. You know, I'd have like that one friend that would be like, happy birthday, Seamus. I'm like, holy cow, this person remembered my birthday. And that just like made me feel like loved that somebody would go and remember my particular birthday of all their friends. And I, I never took offense if, if nobody remembered my birthday. You know, I never, I never expected anything anybody to remember it so when somebody did i always was just delighted by it but now it's the age of the internet and when it's your birthday social media tells everyone and so it's impossible for anyone to it's impossible for me to have that moment where so, where i know that one person actually remembered my birthday because now everybody just gets an automatic reminder today is Seamus Young's birthday why don't you wish them you know why don't you send them a greeting yeah and that just ruins I I know I I haven't logged into Facebook in months and I know I could log in right now and there will be 30 people that I haven't talked to in a couple of years and they'll all wish me happy birthday because Facebook told them to but I'll bet you <laughs> one of those people actually remembered it was my birthday and I would rather have just had that moment of delight finding out that one person actually remembered my birthday. What what an awesome person. And instead, that, that moment is robbed. I'm robbed of that moment. And they're robbed of the recognition of, like, taking notice in me. And, like, the effort they put into remembering my birthday. And it has made our relationships colder instead of warmer. And so... The internet has ruined, social media has ruined birthdays. See, I, I've gamed the system by telling Facebook an, a fallacious birthday. It's not off by much, but it's off by, by more than a day. And so when people say happy birthday on my Facebook birthday, I know you're just, you're just listening to the Facebook robots. Right. That's a good way to handle it. I realize this is the ranting of an old mate, literally now. The ranting of an old man. I think at 50, <laughs> you can officially call yourself an old man. I, I say I can log in right now and, and have those birthday wishes, but actually I won't get those until tomorrow. Anyway. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm always terrible at remembering birthdays also. So Me too. That That's one of the reasons I just am so delighted when somebody remembers mine. Because, if, you know, I feel like, well, I I don't remember your, I like you. I care about you. I think about you sometimes, but I don't remember your birthday. But you took the time to remember mine, and that makes me feel appreciated. So, all the topics this week are mine, for whatever reason. So, we're going to mix them up with some mailbags. So, let's just jump right into the mailbags. What do you say? Okay, let's do it. You can, you can take this first one. Okay, do you want me to... This is the... So, if you remember last show, audience, uh, we talked about someone who sent in a treatise on on video games and, and this is it we've arrived now it's it's coming uh, you need to duck into your foxhole right this is their what do you call that paper that you write just as you become a graduate <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah it's not a term paper it's like your um dissertation your thesis yeah all right well i'll just i'll just read the beginning here it, anybody who wants to read the whole thing it's in the it's not going to be, if you're watching this on YouTube, it's not going to be the YouTube description because as we talked about on a previous show, there's a character limit on that thing. So I'm not going to be able to fit this whole thing in there. Uh, so you're going to have to go over to Seamus' site and read it if you want to read this whole thing. It's got some good insights in it. I, I really like it and it's, it's uh, spurred some thinking, but I'm, I'm just going to read the first part. Dear Diecast, in discussions about a game's difficulty, the concept of artificial difficulty often pops up. This form of difficulty is usually considered a flaw in a game, or at least inferior to the good old farm fresh difficulty. However, 
the distinction between what tends to be called artificial difficulty and difficulty seems to be rather, well, artificial to me. And I have a feeling that these terms create more confusion than bring clarity. What are your thoughts on the term artificial difficulty? With kind regards, Marvin. <laughs> I had to scroll all the way to the bottom before I read that, right. which is why it took so long. With kind regards, Marvin. <laughs> Uh, P.S. Thank you both for making such an enjoyable podcast. Thank you, Marvin, for your excellent question and your own thoughts. We really appreciate it uh, because it helps us to think about it in a clearer way. So I don't run into this. I've run into this term once in a long while, but I don't run into it often on my site. And so to me, it feels a little alien. I'm not sure what people mean when they say artificial difficulty because... I mean, our, all dark difficulty is artificial, isn't it? You can make something as arbitrarily easy or as trivial, you know, or as impossible as you want when you're making a video game. Well, kind of. I mean, you could imagine like a character creator, right? Where like every time you change a, a feature, you have to do a crossword puzzle. And like that would be artificial difficulty. But you can't make it arbitrarily easy because you do have to actually like change the character in some way. Right. So there's like there's a limit to how easy you can make the character creator. There is some inherent difficulty in like what hair color do you want? The game doesn't know. You have to tell it somehow. Right. I normally pull difficulty apart um, into three pillars. Okay. The first pillar is just what we think of as difficulty normally. The skill. You know, the thing you have to perform um, is some sort of timing, some sort of memory, whatever it is, you need to do it. That's the main pillar. Secondary is punishment. You know, what's the cost for failure? You know, the first is how, how easy or how hard is it to fail? You know, or it's not, if 99% of the people are going to fail this on their first try, that's a hard thing to do then. If everybody gets it on the first try, then that's easy. But like, you know, where do you, where do you draw the line on how, you know, where, where it falls on the skill spectrum. And then there's the punishment. What happens when you fail? You know, how much are you going, how punishing is the game? Oh, you just, you, you made a mistake and you died. Start over. Okay. That's pretty harsh punishment. Or, you know, you lose all your items. Or the monster, you made a mistake and now all the monsters get more health. So the game is even harder now. These are all very punishing <laughs> designs. Or you can do the Half-Life thing where it's almost like anti-punishment. Where the game kind of like um, starts pulling its punches when it looks like you're about to go down. And you get um, more loot in the ammo boxes when your ammo is right. low. That kind of thing. Right. It'll still kill you. I mean, if you just stand in the open and like drool on yourself, they, the combine will shoot you to death. I've, I've died enough times to, to prove that. Um, but you know, it creates, you know, the, 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 it's the cushion at the bottom of the, <laughs> at the bottom of your, your failure slide there where it's like, oh, okay, you're, you're down to 10% health. We're going to give you a few seconds where everybody's going to miss you. And that'll create this moment. You have a chance to create that moment of just barely scraping by, getting what you need, and pulling through the fight and wiping the sweat from your forehead and going, whew, that was a close one. Or maybe you'll just die 10 seconds later. But it gives you that little extra, that little extra oomph. Um, and the third pillar is like knowledge. Like there's certain things that just... You have to fail them on the first try to figure out what you're supposed to be. You, you are never, nobody is expected to do this on the first try. You, you have to fail it a few times in order. But once you do have the knowledge or experience, I mean, the, 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 we, we can, you know, make, a, make an arbitrary one of like, here's a hundred doors, pick one. Okay, you picked one. Wrong. You die. Start over. And then, you know, eventually you'll learn that it's door 22. And now every time you get to that point in the game, you know to pick door 22. Now it is trivially difficult. Now it is trivial when before it was very difficult. So, I mean, that's that would be horrible design. But that's just an illustration of how 
of how that's not really skill based that's knowledge based so you've got skill you've got punishment and you've got knowledge now when we talk about artificial difficulty which of those three pillars are we manipulating it feels like uh this the skill is the normal difficulty and the other two are the artificial kind but i mean that's just me okay that, i agree with you there i i didn't want to say it first because i felt like I defined all the terms and I didn't want to just, and here's what I think and you need to agree, but okay, we are on the same page. We both kind of feel like there's the skill of what you have to do and then you can arbitrarily, you know, it doesn't have to be that hard, but if you make it extremely punishing, people will say the game is hard. Right. Um, if it, Like a, a choose your own adventure book has super low punishment, right? Because you can just flip back to the page you were on. There's no... Right punishment for failure but it has often i mean they're often they're very low information where you just like well you just guess what you're supposed to do and and like chart your way through this thing and they don't give you very much information before or else it would be trivial to choose the right path the quote unquote right path right and then i guess the so, opposite would be like dark souls where it's obvious what you have to do like just kill the thing just kill that monster right. and then just kill the next monster just don't die and kill the thing like there's no information requirement, but then the punishment is also much higher. Right. And it requires uh, quite a bit of trial and error to like get the feel for the timing. Oh, 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 oh yeah. here he's it's winding got, up. Yeah, it's got some information difficulty as well there. Right. Like the, the, the quintessential thing I see in some bosses are, okay, he winds up. And so somebody will immediately, ha, I'm going to dodge. And they dodge. And then, but the boss kind of hovers, you know, has his hammer up in the air and holds it there for a second and then brings it down. And that interval <laughs> is just happens to be about as long as it takes you to do a dodge roll. So, right. <laughs> so the designer deliberately made this so that if you attempt to dodge when you notice the attack, you will, you'll take it on the chin. You have to learn the timing. And maybe there'll be a couple of different attacks and they'll each have their own, like, here's one that is very fast, but comes in from the side and you can't do that kind of dodge roll. You need to get, you need to back off. And here's this other move, but it's got this weird timing that'll throw you off. And there's, yeah. I mean, you just, you got to practice. It's like anything else. You just, you got to practice until you get a feel for all the timings. It's kind of like the opposite of a rhythm game where a rhythm game gives you all the timings and then it's just the execution yeah. of like knowing it far enough in advance, right? And in this one, it's like, oh, you don't know the timings. It'd be amazing if there was like something like Dark Souls mixed with Crypt of the Necrodancer or something. Right. <laughs> like all of a sudden you fight a particular monster and now you've got to do it on the off beats. <laughs> you gotta oh no. This one. Yeah. This one, oh, this one you got to dodge on dotted eighth notes. <laughs> <laughs> Just, um, yeah. I, have you seen that some, you know, people have begun doing no hit runs of Dark Souls. I'm sure you've heard about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, people but try then, no hit runs of everything. I mean, like Ikaruga right. is the classic. But somebody did a no-hit run of the Dark Souls trilogy. And I think they included Bloodborne. So that's four games. It's four games back to back to back to back and never getting hit. Yikes. And I mean, I mean, you can imagine what that was like just trying to attain that for the first time. You get six hours into this into the run and you take a hit, and it's like, oh. Time to close Bloodborne and go and open up Dark Souls 1 and start over. Well, I mean, if I was doing it, I would practice the area where I got hit a bunch until I could do it without getting hit right. and then maybe start over. But yeah. But I think these people have just practiced the game to this extreme degree. It's, it's not that they don't know the timing. It's that, you know, after eight or nine hours, you just get tired. Yeah. Does it have to be done as a marathon? Can you like take the weekend off or something i don't well i think you're normally expected to do it while streaming 
just so that people can see you doing it live because otherwise you know it's it's real easy to just splice together a, a run that looks legit but it, you can't right. fake it if you're if you're playing through it live i suppose you could pre-record the game footage and then live stream your face in the corner so you can respond to chat and look like you're doing it live right although that has the it's easy to get caught like that yeah, yeah. You mess up the timing, you look away. You have to like have a, a pause window or something that you could bring up that pauses the video and like puts the game pause screen on. Right, right. And that sounds like a lot of trouble, but it's probably still easier than just learning to <laughs> beat all four <laughs> games without getting hit. Oh, man. Whew. Yeah. So I, I feel like we haven't moved any closer to knowing what artificial difficulty is. And I think this is worth talking about. But what is art of I, I know what people are talking about where it feels like a game is sort of arbitrarily throwing up obstacles and wasting your time or it feels like the game is not respecting your time um, mm, sure if, if there's like a primary skill challenge and then there's some other mini game or something that you have to engage with and you're like I don't care about this mini game I just want to like be doing the primary skill challenge right or you could have it something that just belabors the point like a two minute long um quick time event can feel art you know mm. that starts over if you fail it and it's like well that can feel pretty artificial because you know it's like how long can you go without making a mistake is different from can you perform this task i feel like there's also a kind of difficulty that's what is like lack of a lack of tools difficulty so, like, if you imagine um, trying to play uh, City Skylines, but without, like, tools for knowing how much power you're using, right? Like, you don't know how much electricity you're generating, and just, like, you get brownouts, and you don't know how much more generation capacity to build, and so you just have to kind of, like, guess. And, like, that would be a lack of tools difficulty kind of thing. And I feel like there's a lot of games that kind of insert that kind of difficulty, like... Um, incomplete information i guess is is a similar thing where they're not giving you all the information that you need to make the choice or they've got some sort of task that would be really easy to automate in the computer but instead you have to do it all by hand all right yeah like something you had to lay every piece of the road by hand in city skylines instead of just like dragging a big long line like that would be tools difficulty right just crappy tools or like, yeah. or, or in um, in Dyson Spear Project, where for a while, I think they've added since we uh, I played last, but for a while they didn't have any templates. Like you couldn't like copy a whole section of things and paste it off somewhere else. So like that would be a tools difficulty thing where it's like, well, this isn't a problem of like gathering the resources or, or knowing how to build these buildings. It's just a matter of like clicking all the right spots to build all the things that you need to do the thing that you want to do. Right. A game where you can't, a game where you can't like tell how accurate a weapon is or how much damage it does sure sure well and there are a lot of games where you don't have you don't see health bars right or it's just like well you just keep fighting until right. the enemy dies right i think uh, hollow knight is like that or like no quick travel system where like you can get oh, from one yeah, place to another it just takes time to get there and like well there's no challenge in traversing if there's no challenge in traversing the space then it's like well this is a tools problem this isn't a problem of like it's not difficult because it is hard it's just difficult because you're making me do this thing that it would be easy to automate right a game where you really need all these resources but you can only carry so much so you have to make multiple trips yeah although i mean um, a lot of the inventory management games are like that where do you make multiple runs just so you can carry all the stuff back to town or do they just give you a bigger inventory like with weight limits and things is that really a difficulty thing or is it just a hassle right what is the purpose of inventory limits like that's not that, that's not me being a smart ass that's like okay well why is this limit there why can't i just carry infinite stuff is that for realism that that would be one you know one reason to limit inventory um another one is that so you have to make strate especially if it's a game about resource management then you have to make strategic decisions about do i want more bullets or more healing mm. um 
but some games just seem to like do inventory because that's what games do. <laughs> right. Oh, although there has to be a theoretical cap on it, I guess. Just to keep your save file. I mean, if you can carry an unlimited number of... Mass Effect 1 is a great example of... It was such a pain in the ass to sell weapons. And it was just so tedious and cumbersome that I wouldn't do it. And then you would just have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. They're automatically... You, you don't gather them up after a fight. It just automatically deposits stuff in your inventory. So you don't even know what you've got at any given moment. It isn't like you see it going in. Oh, it's like the opposite problem. It's not hard to like pick right. it up and carry it. It's hard to get rid of it. Right? <laughs> and so, for me, every time it was at the same point in the game, it would be midway through Vermeer, just before the Vermeer survivor dies. I would go to pick something up and I'd get a message. First time in the game, my inventory's full. And there's nowhere to sell or get rid of items at that point in the game. You are in the middle of a big important mission and you can't just like piss off back to a store. And um, that happened to me in multiple runs and I finally like, all right, somewhere around the halfway point of the game, I stop and clean out my inventory. But it takes a long, you know, after Vermeer, I'd go back and everybody's like, oh, I can't believe so-and-so died and this is so tragic. And I'm like, I'm going to go down to the basement and sell all this stuff to the, the weapons guy. <laughs> I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. Yeah, and, and that's so silly in... In Mass Effect especially, you're supposed to be like this super spy, cyber ops, like assassin slash investigator slash senator's aide person. Right. And like, why are you picking things up on the battlefield? There should be like a quartermaster that just handles all that stuff. There's a team that right, does a sweep exactly. after you come through and secure the area. And they do all the... It's probably illegal even to like loot the <laughs> battlefield like that. Isn't that... Right. It's not against some sort of international interstellar law. Right? Can you imagine, like, Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon get back to, like, the temple? And they're like, oh, that was a tough mission. Then Obi-Wan just opens up his robe, and he's got, like, 50 pounds of blaster rifles and robot parts and, and you know, <laughs> right. Bantha dicks right. in, in his sack. And he just dumps it all out and starts selling it. And he spends, like, two hours selling stuff to some guy with three heads. And Qui-Gon is just sitting <laughs> Sets there. Sets up a flea market right there in the temple. <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. It's so silly. Um, so there you go, Marvin. Inventory limits are artificial difficulty and they're silly. You should get rid of them. I feel like I took us off mission. But I, I'm more interested what people have to say about artificial difficulty in the comments. I want, I want to hear other people define this term and, and get a feel for what they think of it. Nice. All right. So every month... For the last, I don't know, six or seven months, I've gotten, you know, a little notification. Oh, your payment to Xbox Game Pass. And I'm like, that's right. I signed up for Xbox Game Pass and I'm not using it. I should either use it or cancel it. And on one hand, I mean, it's a business expense for me, right? Like, that's part of my job. Like, if you're, if you run a website and you post articles, you don't, like, cancel your your stock photo account because you don't need any stock photos this week. It's just, you know, sometimes we need that. So we keep this account open hmm. and, and that's the purpose of it, you know, is oops, I don't have anything to write about this week. Let me find a game and play it until I find something to talk about. That's the thinking anyway, Xbox game pass. There's a huge library and that'll give me stuff to talk about. But really, when it goes for seven months, it's 15 bucks a month. That's money I didn't need to spend. If, if I, it wouldn't bother me if I didn't sp use it every month. But if I go for seven months without using it, then I really need to cancel it. Yeah. So I opened it up. I, actually, Windows Update. It was the weirdest thing. There's a Windows Update waiting. And I was like, oh, fine. 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 And after the reboot, the Xbox game, 
Microsoft PC Xbox for Xbox Game PC. Whatever this stupid thing is, whatever this oxymoronic product is called, um, was open on my computer. Like it just decided to launch itself. And I'm like, oh, oh that's yeah. weird. That's weird, but okay. Let me look through. Here's a huge library of games. I'll, I should find something and just talk, just play it this week. This was a few hours ago. So I start scrolling and I start scrolling. Oh, maybe you play a Halo. I haven't played Halo since the first one. That might be a good conversation. Oh, wait, no. You have to pay for the Halos. You, you don't get any of those for free. <laughs> so the only game I wanted Not to play was the original the one. Uh, maybe the original one. I actually didn't see it in the list. But anyway, I scroll through this list and I'm like, no, 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 no. None of this seems interesting to me. And then I come across Solitaire. On now, Game Pass? I, yeah. Microsoft Solitaire Collection. Now, I'm old enough to remember Windows 3.1. And I don't mean from childhood. I mean, I had a day job. And I'd go to my day job. And then when no one was looking, I'd open up Free Cell in the background and fuck around. Because, you know, that's what you do. <laughs> You're supposed to be working. So uh -huh. I I got really into Free Cell there sometime in 1994 or so. And um, I had fond memories. But then, you know, Windows, Microsoft stop, stopped including... Free cell with versions of Windows. I think I think maybe Windows ninety eight was the last version to have it. So n it hasn't it hasn't been part of Windows this century. Are you sure? I think it I think it's an option when you install Windows, you can tell it to install like the games package or whatever, and just stop being on by okay. default. Maybe. Let me look and see what I've got. Yeah, it's it's not on my machine. But anyway, Microsoft Solitaire. So I remember back in the day when this was just free and everybody had it and i'm like all right i i feel a little nostalgic it's been 26 years since i played free cell let's give it a shot maybe not 26 years but it's been it's been more than 20. so i fire it up and then it's like hey you've got game pass with game pass you get to play solitaire with no advertisements i'm like what <laughs> <laughs> Why would there be ad advertisements on fucking solitaire? <laughs> it's like our hamburgers contain no asbestos. <laughs> it's like, do you need to advertise that? And, and it's and it's an advertisement that they put up in front of the game <laughs> right. telling you that you don't get advertisements. <laughs> right. So then I, you know, I play my first game and I I, I win and it's like <gasps> You, you won! You won! You gained 100 XP! You unlocked this many game chips! You've unlocked some new backgrounds and some new card decks and oh, you've leveled up to level 2 Free Cell player! And I'm like, what is this? What does any of this got to do with Free Cell? <laughs> uh, so then it, I play... Did it open up a world map for you? <laughs> Open up a crafting menu. <laughs> yes. You can, um, you can craft new cards. Powerful new cards. And then I get to the end of the game and it does its little... Well, the end of the first game, it did the little... Um, like it did back in the 90s. Where it has each card fall from its place and bounce along, leaving a trail of car of identical cards behind it. Which even right. in the 90s... It suspends the redraw buffer. Right. Even in 94, I thought it was a pretty cheap effect. I was always like, boy, I know how you did that. That is low effort. And, but it made me happy to see them doing that here in 2021. <laughs> um, but anyway, I completed the second game, and it started setting off fireworks, and then it locked up and crashed. Wait, what? <laughs> it crashed. It crashed. In the middle of fireworks, it just paused. And like hung there for a second and then just vanished in shame. Did it did at least the little window come up saying, don't worry, we're going to report this problem to Microsoft. Nope, nothing. It just vanished. What? Double standard. Right? <laughs> but I just, you know, 
the elves, how they would, I mean, Tolkien's elves would always be so somber. And they're always bitching about how the world used to have so much magic in it. And now it's all gone. And everybody's like, what is your problem? I feel like that now. I remember when this game was free, when it was simple, and when you could just play it and whenever you wanted. And now it wants to be online. And now it wants to, like, advertise that it doesn't have advertisements. And now it wants to, like, give you game points and achievements and unlock levels and level up. And now it friggin' crashes. Even though <laughs> the game is exactly as complicated as it was in 1994. And I feel like all that is beautiful in the world has gone away. <laughs> we are left with this giant poison industry of advertisements and broken technology. Ah. Uh. Yeah, I I did just reread the Silmarillion recently, and and I feel you. <laughs> this is exactly this is exactly what the elves went through. This is exactly it. An end has come in Middle Earth to story and to song. Unless you're willing to pay fifteen bucks a month, and it still crashes, right? And it's still advertising, not having advertisements, and it still gives you levels. Okay. Hey, Seamus. I recently discovered a Let's Play of Mass Effect called The Saddest Party on the Citadel, where the players got where the player got every sidekick killed so that they could have, as the title suggests, the saddest party in the Citadel DLC. Seeing as you played lots of games multiple times each in order to review slash analyze them, have you ever tried to spice up your nth playthrough by essentially trolling a game like this? For example, in Skyrim, I once pickpocketed everyone and stole everything in Riverwood, leading to my character maxing out the associated skills before the game had even properly begun. Provisional username. So, yeah, I've done this for a few games. Um, I don't know if I trolled the game, but I've done weird play, done weird things just to experiment with systems and see if I can break them. I can't remember them all because they're usually like, I don't save them. I don't usually make them part of my write-up because if I complain about anything, people always say, well, it's your fault for playing the game wrong. So it's not a lot of fun. <laughs> so I usually keep this stuff to myself. The um, uh, run you did with the cheat engine, it kind of reminds me of the same kind of thing, right? Where you're like, that's Let's see what true. happens if yeah. I kill this thing in the tutorial when I'm not supposed to kill right. it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the proper way to do that would be to just grind for like 12 hours to get to that level. But like, <laughs> you just use freaking Stay in the forest, engine. killing boars. Right. Just just use Cheat Engine and get on with your day. Um, another thing I did. In Human Revolution, there's a dumb feature. If you pick up a gun... The gun goes in. You were speaking about, you know, inventory systems and inventory Tetris. You pick up an SMG and it'll put the SMG into your inventory. You can open it up and see the SMG. And if you pick up another SMG, the SMG evaporates into nothing and just the bullets go into your inventory. Oh, yeah. I remember right. that. Yeah. And that's terrible because smgs are actually worth a lot of money um especially early in the game and you, you the enemies early in the game drop tons of them so one time i just decided to see what would happen so i'm up on the third floor of a building and i clean out all these gangster cyber dudes that are guarding some bullshit that i don't even remember whatever um I either killed them or, you know, gave them all, gave them all naps. <laughs> so then I pick up one SMG. Now, if I pick up two, you know, the second one will evaporate. So I pick up one SMG. I walk all the way down to the first floor, go through the loading screen, walk a few blocks away and find the shop, go into the building and find the shopkeeper and sell the SMG. Then I walk a few back blocks back to the building, go through the loading screen, go up three floors, and pick up another SMG. And I was gritting my teeth the whole time. I mean, this just took ages. But I did. I sold them all. And I had 
as much money as you would normally have at the end of the game. And it, the game had just started. Oh, my goodness. So, I don't know if I was trolling the game or if the game was trolling me. That's a borderline case there. <laughs> <laughs> Did it make a difference, like, having all that money? Um, yeah, there are a few points in the game where, in a normal playthrough, you won't have enough money to buy these Praxis points as soon as they become available. Like, you get to the set, like, every zone has a shopkeeper, every city you go to has a shopkeeper that sells Praxis points. And, you know, they're like, I don't know, a few grand a piece or something. And normally, you, when you first get there, you don't have enough to buy that Praxis point. And maybe you'll even have to wait until you leave that area, go somewhere else, and then come back later and buy it. But during this playthrough, I was able to buy all of the... Uh, uh, Praxis points are skill points if, for those who haven't played the game. It's just your love. This is how you level up. And I was able to buy them as soon as they were available. So I was more powerful, sometimes being one or two points ahead of, of where I'd be in a normal playthrough, which would, you know, it was nice. I don't know if it was worth schlepping those guns, but it was, <laughs> it was nice. It didn't trivialize anything. Right. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't give me. It would have been interesting if if shopkeepers had just a whole stack of Praxis points that, you know, they didn't have a cap. They could sell as many as you could buy. Then you would then I would have been able to break the entire game right there, you know, buy 20 Praxis points. Just you would have to do there's. There's a zone you go through, and I normally sneak through it because, boy, there's a lot of guys. <laughs> but if you were to do that section loud, you would get dozens of SMGs. And it would be enough to completely pay for an entire game's worth of Praxis points right there. You could walk to the store and buy, you know, just fill out the leveling tree. <laughs> Get all the powers. And some of the zones are, there isn't a shopkeeper in them, right? They're like a special instance or something. Right, right. Yeah, so I think there was maybe two loading screens. One to exit the building and then one to go into where the shopkeeper was. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. Um, I've done weird, dumb, obsessive things. Back in the day when I played Descent... For whatever reason, I played Descent really wrong. Looking back, I just played it wrong. I played it the way you would play a survival horror. Just like super slow and methodical. You're supposed to dogfight. It's a game about dogfighting. Dog, jump out in the open and unleash a bunch of lasers and missiles and blow everything up. And I'd play peekaboo with, you know, the the robots and jump out and shoot at them and then jump back into cover and and I tried to always keep my shield topped off and I didn't I've never done that in any other game and I've never really like figured out why did I do that that's a very boring way to play descent and that isn't how I normally play shooters normally I play shooters high action run around in the open like a crazy person you know, especially shooters of that day, your Quake, your Doom, all that stuff. So why hmm. did I play Descent that way? What was it that yeah. made me... Why did I do that? You know, it might have something to do with our next topic. Ooh. I actually forget what our next topic is. So back in Wolfenstein Enemy Territory, there was this problem. There's a, a video that Seamus uh, put in the show notes, and it's fascinating. There's this problem where players were not only reporting, but actually achieving higher kill rates with one gun rather than another gun. Um, and the problem was that the guns had identical stats in every way. Like they were, they were completely the same, um, except that one of them had different sound design. One of them had a, a bassier, heftier sound, and the other one didn't sound quite so intimidating. And uh, it was actually affecting the way that players were like, able to kill other players in the game, in the multiplayer. Right, you so I wonder feel if more in descent. Yeah, if there was something in descent that made me feel weak. Yeah, well, if like the sound design or 
or the way the enemies sounded or whatever made it seem more intimidating than it really should have been. Right. It was also really early in the in shooters. And maybe I hadn't realized that that was a boring way to play. It's it's hard to remember. I mean, we are talking about almost 30 years ago, and my memories are pretty, pretty dodgy at this point. Like, <laughs> I remember playing Descent. I remember the loading screen taking a while, too. I remember it took a long... Now, of course, it starts instantly. Um, I Yeah, just let like, Microsoft publish it. I'm sure they'd fix that. <laughs> but, like... How much Doom did I play before I moved on to Descent? I believe Descent was the first game I... Yes, Descent was the first game I played where you could look up and down. And so that's why mm. I, I'm an inverted mouse person. You push the mouse forward to look down and pull it back, pull it towards yourself to look up. Because that's, you know, how flight... That was the default controls in Descent. So then when Quake came out... That just felt natural. Another way in which you played the game wrong. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> I'm not wrong. It's the children who are wrong. I am fascinated by this story about the nerfed gun in Wolfenstein enemy territory. I totally missed this story at the time. But yeah, two guns, one for each, you know, what is this? It's a Axis versus Allies. And the Axis gun had a bassier sound and so players felt more powerful they and it was all in their head except that actually translated to more kills they would just yeah. go for it more often and just run out in the open and you would feel more powerful and i wonder how much of that is the enemy also felt we like they were more likely to rout you hear that big boomy gun coming after you and you want to run away you know, or stay in cover. And so... Yeah. Um, I'm really curious if it would have the same effect if it was a really large player base and a really long time, or if that effect would wash out eventually as people learned not to be afraid of the sound, right? If, right. if the effects weren't there. Like if this was PUBG or something and there were millions of people playing millions and millions of rounds, if the effect would, would wear off or if it would remain. And if the gun itself was one of many like one of the problems with wolfenstein is you know this was your sort of bread and butter gun this was one of the main guns that players would use where in like a PUBG, where there's a huge selection of weapons and you never know what you're gonna get and so mm, it would true. get yeah so it wouldn't dominate the numbers so much i don't know that's an interesting it's a, it, I'm fascinated by it because it shows how much game design isn't about the numbers. It's about our perception of the numbers. And that's really hard to d design around. You can sit there and make your platonic ideal game where everything's perfectly balanced according to the spreadsheet. But that doesn't necessarily mean people will perceive it that way. Uh, I, a lot like in XCOM where it feels like you miss when you shouldn't. Even though, you know, statistically, oh, it said you had a 5% chance of missing, and you did. And it seems like you, you know, when you get those numbers, it feels like you you shouldn't miss. Oh, you know, the, the odds are never as high. The, it misreports the odds. And no, the odds are correct. It's just that you notice when you miss. Mm. A 95% feels like you should never psychologically it feels like you should never miss and you miss all the time at 95 percent yeah you miss one out of 20 shots i although in that case part of the problem is that it is just a number like there is no okay you are one square away from this person and you're holding an automatic weapon and they're in front of you that's not 95 percent to chance to hit that's 100 percent I'm a trained soldier. How could I possibly miss an entire turn of shooting my automatic weapon at somebody who's literally close enough to smooch? Right. Empty the mag. You don't have a jam. Somehow you miss. Right. I think that is an unaddressed flaw in the system. It's, it's kind of like critical failures in D&D. &D. Yeah. Oh, you rolled a one. You failed. It's like... Really? 
really my professional person doing something this professional thing fails one out of 20 times you know imagine pizza driver run one out of 20 pizza deliveries he crashes his car <laughs> yeah i i think the idea in D D, and certainly this is not the way that a lot of people use it but i think the idea is that you only roll for stuff where it's actually a challenge where you're right. actually being being challenged with something difficult you don't roll to walk down the sidewalk exactly i, I think that's that is the root of that problem because well we, we gotta roll the dice a bunch because that keeps it interesting and it's like yeah but now you have you know people failing to do their jobs yeah all right dear Your die cast, cast. oh, oh. <laughs> whose turn is it i think it's speaks my first. turn okay go for it dear die cast I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the ongoing Blizzard fiasco. Do you think good and healthy video game company management is truly possible? Or is it inherent due to the unstable nature of game development and human dysfunction? Love, Donkey. I really wish that you didn't have such a funny name, Donkey, because this <laughs> is a very difficult question. I, for me, I think it's interesting. Some... Some disciplines are very stable i mean there are assholes everywhere in the world but you don't see entire industries dominated by idiots um this is something i want to make a video about where we have an industry being run by people who don't understand the industry like walt disney was the foremost expert on family theme parks. Can you imagine if Hugh Hefner was trying to run Disney World and they, you know, he's not a family guy. He didn't have any kids. He doesn't know what it's like to try and take a family on vacation. Walt Disney had this intuitive understanding of what the customer was looking for when they show up at Disney World. And Hugh Hefner, although a also a very successful businessman, would have failed at that same it would have failed at running disney world because he did not have that domain experience and that is what i see going on in the video game industry and i'm it is weird that we have basically all of the big companies run by well ubisoft activision and ea the big three run by non-gaming executives and those are the most dysfunctional companies those are the ones that have all this i mean it's not just that they're not gamers they are also not software developers um they are not entertainment guys they are just like business dudes and that is weird that is really weird go to any other mm. go to any other domain and you will not find i mean you you'll find that a little bit everywhere it happens um you know, a son inherits a company from his father and the son doesn't doesn't know anything about the business, but he inherits it. Stuff like that. Or just somebody blunders their way into being in charge or whatever. But the big three are all, and I think that's the root of this dysfunction. So yeah, good and healthy video game company management is truly possible. It, we hear very good things out of Valve Software. Gabe Newell, an executive, knows the business is a software developer, was a game developer, understands the jobs that people do, and it, the company absolutely runs fine. People love it there. It's everybody's dream job. Um, mm, yeah, absolutely. It's certainly possible. It is absolutely possible. So yeah, uh, I don't know much about Japanese. I'm always really shy of, of commenting on Japanese companies, but my intuition is that the people running Nintendo understand the business. Uh, I don't know if it's nice to work there. I don't know anything about life in Japan or how it compares to working at other companies. But I've never gotten the impression that, oh, the people running in Nintendo have no idea what video games are all about. Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, it, certainly, is, it certainly is possible to manage it well. Although I think that um, you've identified some problems with the, the management, like the kind of people who end up in charge of these companies. And, but I think the problem also stems from 
the kind of people who are attracted to working in these kind of environments. And I want to draw a parallel between games industry stuff and working for Elon Musk companies, because both of them have this kind of uh, mystique about them of like, oh, you really want to work there. They're doing really cool stuff. They're doing stuff that people want to do and it's attractive, but, and, and that's great, but as a result, the the kind of people who end up working there are the ones who are willing to make sacrifices that no one else is willing to make in yes. order to do that. So you do attract the kind of people who are willing to work for 80 hours a week when you're working on rocket ships that are going to go to Mars. Like, And there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to do that and you're willing to make those sacrifices, that's, that's absolutely your decision. But then if you just want to work on rocket ships going to Mars and you're not willing to make those sacrifices... It gets really hard to get into the industry, and so it makes it feel like the industry is is oppressive and it's really, you know, it's cr soul crushing. But really, it's just that there's so much supply of people who want to do this thing that they can afford to be choosy. The people who are hiring people can afford to be choosy and and just pick the ones who are going to work the longest hours and they can, require yeah, they the can, least amount of benefits. They can, from their p perspective, they can hire all the doormats. And you're like, but I don't right. want to be a doormat. I just want to, you know, work normal hours. And it's like, well, then you can't work at this sexy company because this sexy company has just an endless army of doormats wanting to work there. And I think this also goes back to knowing what you're doing. I think if, yes, there are the, those people that are just willing to let the company walk all over them. But if you're an exec, you know, if I tried to do that at Valve Software and kill myself with 80-hour work weeks, somebody there, Gabe, I mean, it probably wouldn't be Gabe personally, but let's just, for the sake of illustration, Gabe would say, hey, look, I know you enjoy working here, but this work will be here next week. Well, this work will still be here on Monday when you come in. Go home. Not because I don't want a bunch of free labor from you, but because actually writing code if you've been writing code, you know, if you spend 80 hours writing code a week, those last 20 hours of code are going to be really shitty. And I don't want people to have to fix your bugs. <laughs> like, the, right, uh, right. Like you're, you're causing problems. I understand the job is fun, but you need to take breaks. It is physically important to do this because this job is very mentally taxing. You can... You can, you shouldn't, but you can work on an assembly line and drill bolts, you know, for 80 hours a week. And those bolts will still, you know, bolt the thing together. But for creative jobs, um, your mind disengages eventually. And then the quality of your work drops off drastically. Again, this is something that you would know if you understood the industry. And it's something that is opaque to you if you're Bobby Kotick and you just sort of like, oh, whatever, just, you know, make me games as fast as you can. And we'll just put out games and I'd have no idea how to judge the quality of the work being done or the final product that's produced. And we'll just sort of like spam the world with games like we're a virus just making copies of itself. Yeah. No, oh, and that's no another concept. aspect, which is, uh, like you were saying, if if you don't know what the quality of the work is, like if you don't know how to judge it, then it's really difficult to figure out if people are, the people you're managing, if you're doing a good job managing them or not. And uh, right. I, like a friend of mine hired a company to make an app for them and, but they're not a coder. And I was like, oh, that's not a good, it's not a good plan. No. Like there's. Because, you know, they give you a, a benchmark, you know, like, oh, hey, we made progress to this point. And like, here's what, here's how far we got. And like, how do you know if that's reasonable or not? How do you know if it, if they're on their way to making what you want or, or not? Or how do you know if they're just stringing you along until you run out of money? Like, you have no idea. There's no way for you to, for you to tell that. Whereas if you have even a little bit of skill in the area, then you can, be like, oh, I see. I see what's going on. Oh, okay, you're working on this and you can give them some real guidance as opposed to just like, do it faster for less money. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You, If you don't know anything about the quality of the work, then that's the only thing you can ask for is do it faster for less money. And that's all you, and that's, 
when you push for that, that's unreasonable and you don't know if what you're getting and you don't know if the quality is dropping off. That's a really great way of looking at it. Yes. And that's essentially what Bobby Kotick is doing. Oh, also, he seems to be asleep at the switch. I mean, it's just like rampant, like all these human resources problems where even if he's a sociopath that doesn't care about the people that work for him, like, come on, you know, you know what's up. You've seen the news. You know that doesn't end well. Oh, we have a guy with 50 sexual harassment complaints against him. Uh, it's just fine. I'm sure it's nothing. I'm sure that's not anything that requires my attention. Oh, no. Right? Like, <laughs> like, even if you don't care about your people, even if you literally care nothing for them and you just see them as disposable equipment, you've seen the news. You know how that ends. It's like, yeah, you wouldn't, what you is wouldn't that let guy... someone just like walk around installing like Bitcoin mining rigs on all your, right. your development PCs and burning out the graphics cards. Like, even if you, even if you don't care about the, the morality of it, it's still burning up your resources. Like those things are expensive. Right. What's this guy to you? What's this guy to you? Is he like your buddy? Is he related? To you? No, he's, you know, he's five steps down the totem pole from you. He's, you don't even know his name and he's causing all these problems for you. Just fucking fire him. What, what do you do all day if you're not managing people and you're not judging the quality of your products? Like, what does Bobby <laughs> Kotick do when you have no Marketing, understanding? Marketing, apparently. You, right? So, yeah, that's, that's my, I, I'm trying to gather up all those thoughts and turn them into a rant that's different from everybody else's rant like everybody else's rant is hey companies should be nice to us and and companies should behave and be responsible and i kind of want to do a video of like okay i'm going to take the position of a rhetorical businessman who only wants money and doesn't care about his people and thinks they're disposable and even judging on those criteria bobby kodak is still an absolute garbage fire of a leader just he, embarrassingly incompetent i i need to look up and see if he actually owns the place like this is a distinction most people don't make um like elon musk is in charge because he owns the friggin company he wasn't right it's his money right where on the other hand um andrew wilson was hired by some board some some entity that owns electronic arts and they have hired this person to do the job and uh, well it I doesn't even own electronic arts right it's a publicly traded company they're, they're right, tasked right. But, on behalf of the owners with managing right. the company right right on behalf of the shareholders or however that works um so and i don't i don't remember which bobby Kotick is if he owns the place then well, then I guess it's his to run into the ground. Um, but <laughs> right. as, as incredible have, as that sounds, it, it is his prerogative to just burn it all down like the Joker on a pile of cash. Right. Um, but I, I'm willing to, Nobody else owns it except for like Gabe no Newell. Like these companies are so big. I'd be surprised if Kodak was actually an owner. But I don't know. Kodak has been in the business for a long time and spent a long time wheeling and dealing and, and, it, and you know, running different companies. So before I write my, my video, I need to look that up and figure that out. Um, it, it makes the argument easier to make if he's hired by somebody, because then I can make the case that they should fire him. <laughs> like, but like what percentage of Activision is publicly traded? You know who has controlling share is he burning down his own company or is he grossly mismanaging somebody else's assets and he looks like he owns a non-controlling stock in activision blizzard interesting well that does make it easier to make my case that he should be ousted preferably you should get a time machine and go back 10 years and oust him sometime in the late aughts um, because he did a lot of damage over the like he he has a massive negative value
what he did to Blizzard is just shocking. It's just shocking how badly he's run Blizzard into the ground. I've made this case before, like Blizzard used to be this endless font of new stuff. Like they invented not only new stuff, but good new stuff, like the best stuff and also right. <laughs> and also the most cutting edge stuff. Right. New genres of games and esports and you know, they didn't invent the MMO, but they invented they made the MMO that dominated the industry, that shook the industry to its core, a game that was so good, other companies killed themselves trying to compete with it. Like, that's the level of quality that Blizzard had. You're not even trying to kill these companies. You're just so good, they die in your presence. <laughs> yeah. It's like turn undead. And, exactly. And now... It's been it's been less than twenty years. It's you know he's he's been like he used to leave Blizzard alone and Blizzard kind of managed itself. But as he's taken it over more and more, these days all Blizzard does is re-release old stuff and they're fucking that up. They can't even recreate the good games they used to make. <laughs> not only can they not make awesome new stuff, they can't even just repackage their own legacy and sell it to us to a willing mm -hmm. audience that is a shocking failure not just in video games but that is like one of the most appalling management failures of the modern world like to take something worth that much and to make it worth that little it's one thing if you run blockbuster hey vhs has died streaming came along and killed it but Bobby Kotick did that damage to his own company in a growing industry, like a flourishing yeah. industry. Can you imagine like at the dawn of the automotive age when cars are selling like crazy and you're running a car company that implodes? <laughs> like, how do you do that? The Edsel? Are we going to go there? I guess. Like, I mean, there have been that's what mismanagement said. failures in, in every technology in every age. So it, right, it's not like he's a do uniquely it. poor manager. I think he's this generation's great failure, though. Like, we only get a, we only get a fuck up that big once in a generation. Yeah, well, there aren't that many beautiful, perfect things to destroy. Exactly. Exactly. So silly. Um, do we have time for this last one? I feel like we're running long. We are running long. We could save this for next week. Let's do that. Done. All right. The risk of having done my Blizzard rant here is that maybe now I won't want to make a video about it. I don't know. We'll see. You could just take um, your EA rant and just like voice over Blizzard whenever you say EA and ship it. It'll be fine. Here's the thing. I did that video about executive salaries are not the problem and people argued with no no salaries are the problem salaries are the problem here's the analogy i came th this is my follow-up to that it's like somebody was hired by the mob the mob gave him ten thousand dollars to to go and burn down this coffee shop and your complaint is ten thousand dollars that's way too much money to burn down a coffee shop and i'm like <laughs> really that's your problem here <laughs> I would have done it for three. Right? <laughs> These overpaid arsonists are the ruin of this industry. Uh, so, that's my Blizzard rant. Thank you to everybody who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. As a reminder, we record this on Saturday nights. I notice a lot of you sending in questions on Sundays. When you do that, your question can't be answered on that show. Just pro tip. <laughs> it's the pre-record show, call-in show. <laughs> yes! Oh my goodness, that is one of the most brilliant skits ever. Miss, that's the only Mr. Show I've ever watched, but I've watched that skit many times. I'll try to remember to link it in the show notes. Anyway, thanks so much to everybody who sent in questions. Say goodbye, Paul. And goodbye.
good show. Good show. We're going to have a stinger about like Blizzard to just try to make solitaire now. <laughs> Can you imagine? And it would just be awful. It would be 50 gigabytes and um, it would have microtransactions in it and voice acting and cutscenes. <laughs> And it would crash all the time. <laughs> it's like Hearthstone, but there's no player on the other side. Right. <laughs> right. I was just thinking their most recent Tony Hawk game where, like, the skateboard, you'd do a kickflip and you would just, like, rock it into the ground like a nail that had been driven into the ground and your <laughs> board would shoot up in the air. Like, levels like you'd try and move a card around in solitaire and it would just get stuck in the tabletop. <laughs> I'd just freak out as the physics engine screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, each card has real thickness, but when you pick it up, it like squeezes the card together, so it like fights with itself. Right, <laughs> right. They'd be wrong cards on the board. There'd be like the the thirteen of staves, and you're like, wait, is that's not a card? Ah, uh, the proprietary save system. <laughs> <laughs> Always online. Okay, I feel like for real talk though, like it seems like anybody can make solitaire now like you could just code it up in like a few minutes right that's an afternoon project in unity or even like code it in python and like have text entry or whatever if you don't care about the graphics right right 